very warm uh, welcome to this uh, blended session. This session uh, is going to be focused on latest generation of uh, OCT, HF uh, OCT. I'm uh, Giulio Guagliumi from uh, Milan. Here you can see the full disclosure of uh, the major speaker and uh, the people they are anchoring uh, this uh, session. We have essentially three objectives. The first one is to see how HF OCT overcomes the limitation of the current intravascular imaging in complex lesion PCI. The second is to learn how pre-PCI imaging assessment is a pivotal to guide the lesion preparation and the device selection. And the last one is to discuss the use of this uh, latest generation of uh, OCT imaging for planning and stent optimization in the real world complex uh, cases. You have immediately one picture of the people they are going to take a part of this uh, exciting session. And uh, you can see discussant, uh, spokesman, and uh, uh, the people they are going to interact with us uh, during the session. I would say the Ivan, Hiram, Nevis, Tom, and Jost will be with us. It's a case in point session, and uh, uh, to be a case in point session means uh, that uh, this is uh, the key point. This is uh, the type of the lesion we will face during this uh, challenging uh, session, and. Uh, well, the first point is uh, if uh, we might launch uh, the poll now, would you attempt baseline imaging without uh, pre dilation? And uh, you might have a few seconds for getting. That's two people. The answer 50 50 and then uh, during the discussion we are going to ask uh, to our discussant to enter a little bit more why they are attempting why they are not uh, attempting this uh, lesion and so without uh, any type of uh, excitation i'm going uh, to go stop and i'm going to go ahead and uh, leaving the floor uh, to my friend uh, iran bezera iran Let's get a little bit of background on this uh, complex lesion and what we know about uh, lesion complexity and imaging. Thank you very much, Giulio, and welcome, everybody. So a little background. Uh, this is uh, undisputable that intravascular imaging has a positive impact on, on patients' outcomes. And uh, if we are dealing with long lesions illustrated on, on this slide here, uh, it definitely favors intravascular image, either IVUS or in particular OCT. Despite that, we don't see uh, a high penetration of intravascular image on, on this subset of patients or any patient in, indeed. And we need to ask ourselves why? The common answer that we got is that it might take a little bit too much time. It's difficult to obtain pre-PCI image. Uh, when you're dealing with OCT, you might add too much contrast. This is one of the most common barriers or answers that, are, that we get when the question is being posed. Why we are particularly emphasizing the pre-PCI on this session. Because it's been more than a decade that we've been promoting that where uh, imaging adds the most value is on the procedural planning. So in 2013, we published a paper that was a single center describing that 80% of the time, if the operator commit with a strategy angel only, and then you give him the OCT information, he changed his mind somehow in terms of stent selection or lesion preparation. This was followed by a Lumen 1 trial, who essentially got the same uh, answer. 
and more recently presented EuroPCR in 2020, the Light Lab Initiative. So there is a, a very significant impact on the decision making when you do imaging pre. But then it comes, okay, so what are the barriers on image pre? Or the catheter might be too big and occlusive, or I cannot even cross, or I cannot displace blood properly, and then I stop skipping this, and my added value of the procedure kind of get lost. Uh, there is a limitation on pullback length. I'm not imaging the entirety of the vessel. Or uh, I'm using too much dye because it takes too long to acquire that pullback. So this third generation of OCT means to address all these limitations. So first is the smallest scatter of any intravascular imaging you have on the shelf is 60% smaller than, than any other uh, intravascular image. You can acquire uh, 100 millimeters of vessel in one second, right? So the two pillars are the cat itself, but also the engine, the laser, very fast laser that can acquire 100 millimeters per second and with a larger field of view. So now you also open the doors for large vessels, namely le left main. I'm gonna pause here just, uh, it's fascinating because this main, Dr. Guagliumi, introduced me the first generation of OCT that never came to US, me as a, as a core lab receiving time domain from him. He had to disable uh, 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 bypass the machine safety mechanism because the vessel had to be occluded for so long <laughs> because the pullback was take one millimeters per second. And now we are at a hundred millimeters per second. So this is, I had to, to make that comment, Julia, because it's, it's really historical. Have it's embarrassing <laughs> yeah. for the age. Eh? <laughs> Don't go back and count the age of Dr. G, but he's okay. Well, well I'm including right. myself <laughs> okay, on this. So, <laughs> so to answer the question um, on the pre-dilatation, there is not right or wrong on this answer, but this case was offered without pre-dilatation. And so that nasty long lesion, you can see that that catheter really flying at 100 millimeters per second. They are quite different from the time domain. So I stop here and uh, I invite Dr. Evan, uh, Evan Shilosmus to, to continue with the case presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Haram. So you know, a critical mass of people wouldn't even bother attempting baseline intravascular imaging just based on their experience with previous technology. So here we saw the imaging catheter does cross at baseline. That's the first step. The second thing is what about the images? If the images aren't interpretable, you don't have a clear imaging feel, it's not very helpful. So we'll get to the imaging in a moment and you'll be able to see for yourself what baseline imaging looks like. The case, 74-year-old male, prior history of diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, had a prior stent to the LAD six years ago, outside hospital, so we don't have the specific information with the prior stent. Patient presented with unstable angina. So here's the baseline intravascular imaging. If you're not familiar with the Gentuity HF-OCT system, the focus of the screen is what you need to look at, the OCT cross-section. So we have the OCT cross-section that takes up the majority of the screen. Now, for every cross-section, you get automated lumen area as well as lumen diameter. And then on the right, we have our longitudinal profile. At the bottom is distal, proximal on top. And you have a number of things that get automated. We can do length. Um, we have automated length. You get MLA. It'll identify where the MLA is and what the exact lumen area is for the minimal lumen area as well as the references. And you see with the lumen profile, you can see uh, the dimensions here. So I'm going to play it through once so that everyone can see. So going from distal to proximal, one thing that stands out with that diffuse critical stenosis is a clear imaging field, which makes the image interpretable, which allows you to make an assessment of exactly what we're looking at. So just starting from distal again, distal small vessel, we're seeing a completely clear imaging field without any blood swirl. 
And despite the presence of diffuse disease, if you notice here, we can see the EEL nearly circumferentially. So you get clear EEL visualization with a completely clear lumen field despite a highly stenotic lesion. As we're moving more proximally, again, you, you continue to see the EEL. You see there's significant diffuse disease, and now we're getting to our prior stent. So baseline imaging, we can see what the etiology of instant restenosis is. You see clearly the stent struts. We see here homogeneous neoendomal hyperplasia. As we move more proximally, we can evaluate the different morphologies with ISR. So right here, we start to see um, lipidic plaque, you'll see in a moment. Yeah, so here we, we see the nice example of lipidic neoatherosclerosis, which was surprising because based on the angiogram, it looks more like a calcific instant restenosis. So here, very nice example, lipidic neoatherosclerosis, which of course is managed in a completely different way than calcific plaque is. And had we predilated this risk with lipid of distal embolization, and it alters the baseline morphology. Continue to move proximally, and now we're approaching our minimum lumen area. So again, area of 0 0.8, very often you don't see areas this small on baseline intravascular imaging, partly because catheters don't always cross here. But not only is the catheter crossing, you see even with an area of 0 0.8 millimeters square, you see a perfectly clear imaging field without any blood swirl. As we continue to move proximally, we see that the stent goes all the way back to the ostium of the LAD. And now we get into the left main. And here in the left main, we're seeing the other end of the spectrum. Not just did we see the small vessels able to see the entire vessel distally, but proximally, here we see areas of 16. And again, there's no blood swirl, proximal left main. And part of this is based on the technology it crosses and able to deliver distally because of the small catheter size, the 1.8 French, but partly because of the rapid pullback, a one second pullback, and just a small amount of contrast, we're able to get the full 100 millimeter visualization without any significant blood swirl. So a couple of things just to highlight here, we have an area in the proximal LAD with an underexpanded stent. You see the stent diameter is just 2.1. It was an undersized stent and there's neoatherosclerosis. And specifically here you see it's lipidic neoatherosclerosis. The other thing is we see from the angiogram, it's a diffusely diseased vessel. And if you're going by angiography, one approach would be 90 millimeters of additional stent layer. But if you can hone in on what really needs to be addressed, and try to minimize and simplify the procedure, that often has some advantage. So you see here, because we can deliver the catheter distally, we're able to evaluate that lesion distally, although it's a small MLA of just 1.2, when you compare it to the distal reference, it's actually only a 40% stenosis. I think in this case, you can manage it medically as a result, and we don't have to stent all the way down to the apex. Now, approximately, the stent comes all the way back to the osteal LAD, but we're able to see, though there is some plaque here, the minimum lumen areas all exceed 4.5 millimeters squared, and there's a prior stent there. So there is some advantage of avoiding a second layer of stent. In the US, we're not fortunate to have drug-coated balloons available. It's one of the limitations of our inherent technology that we have available. So I think avoiding a second layer of stent when you already have a minimum lumen area of 4.5 and greater um, has some advantages as well. So as a result, without treating the proximal and distal segments, which we didn't have to predilate and commit prior to the baseline imaging, we're able to shorten the stent that's necessary and with a single 38 millimeter stent, approach the significant lesion. So thank you very much, Ivan, for presenting this, uh, this case. Because it's a latest generation of uh, OCT, we took also a, the latest generation of interventional cardiologists. <laughs> and you saw in the corner, Tom Johnson and uh, Nieves uh, and uh, Jost. Uh, let's make a little bit of a discussion, quick discussion about uh, how frequently you are approaching these type of patients, diffuse disease uh, with uh, 
very tight noses, how you can deal uh, with uh, this uh, different uh, aspect in your clinical practice. Very quickly going around. Tom, you are start first. Well, so yeah, d diffuse disease certainly is an indication for me in terms of complexity or more concerningly, the long-term outcome for patients. I think in this setting, diffuse disease in the context of prior stent failure, it's mandated. So if it were me, I don't, I'm not having another stent put in unless I know why the first one failed. And so to understand that is, is key. The other element we have here is we have a stent failure where imaging may well have been challenging using the existing generation, the last generation catheters, and we're committing ourselves then to intervention at that point because we predilate in order to then get the imaging probe down and make the, make the decision. We can get more information without committing to the downstream intervention. We can consider surgical revas, we can consider other, other therapies. So, so there would be the reasons for absolutely supporting this as the strategy used. Okay, we were terrified about uh, uh, the timetable, and then I was uh, watching a few seconds ago, I said, uh, wow, we are ahead. And so we are just uh, spending a little bit of time with uh, this uh, discussion, and, all with, uh, and also with the audience uh, to understand uh, this aspect. And yes, what about the ISR? That is a very important uh, indication that uh, frequently is coming as a long ISR, how you are dealing with uh, these patients. No, I, I think it's uh, number one indication for imaging is uh, stem failure. I mean, for me, as, um, no, as, as Tom mentioned, I mean, I don't think it's um, fair nowadays uh, to, to treat uh, stent uh, restenosis without understand what, understanding what is the problem, what is the mechanism of failure, and then treating it uh, accordingly. So um, I always uh, use imaging, especially OCT, because OCT, of course, can give a level of detail, especially about the type of tissue you have inside the stand that you cannot get uh, get uh, with IBUS. Um, it's also interesting, you know, to have a catheter that can cross very tight lesions. One of the um, problems that we have sometimes with imaging, especially when people is starting, that people get really frustrated if they don't get good images. So if you do a pullback uh, and then you get a lot of blood and you don't get good clearance or you have an automatic play and it starts too, too late and then everything is full of blood. This is really frustrating. So everything that can improve, you know, the, the easy to obtain good images is, is basic, I think, for, for the implementation of uh, imaging use. Okay, just a, a different question. Everybody is questioning the amount of contrast. So to get this quick pullback in one second, when we are recommended to use imaging baseline and perhaps multiple times during the procedure, can be an advantage. How do you think uh, that uh, this could overcome a little bit uh, this uh, barrier? Yeah, Drew, I think that's a great point. Uh, one of the barriers for using OCT always has been the use of contrast, but it, I think by improving technologies, faster pullback speeds, so with this technology you, you can get 10 centimeters in just one second, uh, you can significantly down size the amount of contrast you need. So for a full LED, you may not need more than eight, eight to nine cc's of contrast. Um, that, that's number one. And the second is you can see in the, in the intro that here I'm showed, even with the catheter in situ, you can, de you, get, you can get decent contrast to pacification of the full artery. So there's no need to do multiple angiographic projections. You can simply take the angio you make for the OCT pullback as a angiographic projection you use for your clinical decision making. So there's no need to do separate uh, contrast injections, one for the angio and one for the OCT pullback. Okay, two minutes for any burning questions about the case or about the technology that you might have. Anybody want to address one burning question about the case, different idea, different opinion, or something that you are concerned when you are using normally the OCT technology? Giuseppe, no question from Italy? One question. Problem with the present OCT is when we have osteal lesions like osteal left main or right coronary artery is very difficult. You may have the different techniques suggested like to use uh, some kind of uh, extension catheter or something. So this kind of, do you have any solution for them, particularly osteal lesions? Well, that's what I agree. 
lots of cases with Austin where I use guide extension catheters with, with alternative OCT technology. But that was one of the things that, and I could play back the picture again of the left main, there was no guide extension. Um, and you're able to see with the proximal left main, despite it being a 16 millimeter vessel, you have a completely clear imaging field. So not only can you analyze the vessel, the clear imaging field, partly because it's such a rapid pullback happening in one second that there's no time for that blood swirl, that hand injection of just a couple of cc's of contrast, you can still clear it. So it actually changes your, your practice because you can evaluate that. And partly that, that's usually when people start playing out an IBIS catheter and the osteo right or osteo left main, but there's all the advantages we know in certain clinical situations with ISR and calcium with OCT. So here there's a modality that we can see morphology of ISR, we can see thickness of calcium, but we still get a clear imaging field. Okay, let's leave uh, some work uh, for the R&D team. They were able to bring uh, some novelties and uh, there is uh, still something that uh, can be done. So the osteo lesion, as we can see. Hiram, let's move on to the smart screen for a second. Stay here just for the mic. No, no, no. Okay. And uh, let's, uh, you are staying this way. Yeah. Let's uh, try to get uh, the spawn screen in, uh, in the full uh, picture. And, uh, okay. That is another point uh, that we'll like very quickly now to discuss uh, here. Yeah. Do you want uh, to comment on this image? Yeah. yeah I want to comment on this image and capitalize on, on a comment that, that Tom made it. Uh, that is, we are navigating in, in new waters here because it's really the first time that we have the luxury to get this kind of image without any vessel manipulation. So let's assume that what we see here, it's not fibrotic, but it's a nasty, nasty calcium. I think we might want to time out and consider a Lima to LAD, right? So because we, are not, we haven't manipulated this vessel yet. Right, so this is fascinating for me. On this particular case, what we see is a grossly underexpanded stent because we are dealing with a proximal AD and the stent is 2.1. So I don't even need to give you a reference to claim that. This is grossly underexpanded stent. It is, however, all fibrotic behind this stent. There, there is no calcium whatsoever. Why is fibrotic? How do you say that is fibrotic? Well, because I learned with Dr. Guagliomi long, long, long time ago. <laughs> there was no plan. This is a free, free interpretation of the planning. <laughs> that, that fibrosis on OCT is a homogeneous, uh, major range backscattering that is going to be bright, right? So there is no... Uh, dark tissue that, that resemble uh, a calcium there. And inside the stent is the same pattern of tissue as well, right? So there is no intimidating calcium here for, for, for me. And then another crucial aspect that uh, Ivan was uh, bringing to the attention is uh, this picture. What we are seeing in the picture? So, so here, image interpretation uh, for a few you see that how interesting is that you start even losing the stent struts here on this segment. So that means that there is a lot of attenuation of the laser, right? So all this, all this is necrotic core. All this is neoatheral. So uh, means a lipid. Lipid. Because of the lipid is a damp in the signal. That's right. So we are making an interpretation about the, the type of tissue we have inside and perhaps we can also de define which type of tools uh, we wanted to use uh, for counteracting uh, this type yes. of Yes, I think the most important is uh, that angiographically, we could not rule out calcium. Now we can, right? So there is no calcium playing a role here, uh, and that can change dramatically the way we approach this case. Okay, so we might have a poll, or you might uh, watch it to this one. And so we can use also the hands because it's simple or the pool. Maybe we have this pool 
uh, running. So we wanted to understand if after having seen the OCT imaging, would you consider lesion preparation? Who is in favor to do lesion preparation? Stand uh, your hands up. Okay, down. Who is not in favor for lesion preparation? Very few. <laughs> and among all that I said, uh, I wanted to do lesion preparation. You have uh, three different options, two different options. One is uh, IDL. The other one is, uh, well, I wanted to go with a scoring and uh, cutting or cutting balloon. Who is in favor to use IDL here? Good, nice, means that you understood exactly. <laughs> Who is in favor to use a cutting or scoring balloon? Okay, quite how, significant. How, how about laser? Laser on body, what no. about a normal balloon? Some non-compliant, uh, they said. Okay, so even, we are plenty of curiosity. Go and show what you did. And we needed to have, uh, again, back uh, the screen. All right, so uh, just before I show actually what we did, just one comment, because I think you know we all agreed on the panel that you need imaging to determine the mechanism of ISR. I just want to comment, because we are in Paris. Last month, the France PCI registry was published in CRM, a study looking at ISR, looking at utilization of intravascular imaging in ISR, less than 2%. Less than 2% intravascular imaging for instant restenosis is the reality that's used for treating ISR in France. So it, that's really eye-opening. And part of it is, is there technology that makes it easy to use? Because we all can appreciate the benefit of intravascular imaging in determining the mechanism to at least guide what your treatment strategy is. As we see, there's a number of different treatment strategies that people would take, but you need to have an educated approach based on the imaging to really guide you. So we went with a 3.0 by 38 millimeter drug loading stent, approximately was post dilated with a 3.5 NC at 28 atmospheres, distally with a 3.0 NC at 28 atmospheres. And on the right, we see the final angiogram. Now it's important to check your work. Let's make sure that we achieve what we sought out to achieve. Was that an adequate strategy? Did we get an optimal result? You've already purchased the OCT catheter, and that's why it's critical to use it both at baseline and post-PCI as well, and see if there's any further areas needed for optimization. Just a couple of differences on the post-PCI that you'll notice with the software. Again, we have the cross-section in the middle of the screen. On the right, with the Lumen profile, you'll see the rendered stent. And that's important. There's a couple of different features that you're going to see here. I'm going to play the OCT pullback. Distal to proximal, we see we're approaching the stent edge. We're able to visualize the stent. Then here we see proximally back into the left main. So just a couple of points to highlight again, distally clear imaging field that we're able to see. First thing I do always after PCI, you look at the distal stent edge, exclude an edge dissection. There's no distal edge dissection. We work our way through the stent, stands out that there's great apposition, there's good stent apposition, and now we're at the proximal segment and there's no significant edge dissection proximally. So you've excluded any significant edge dissection, you've ensured there's good apposition. The next in the algorithm, you follow an MLD max for the approach. The last thing is just checking the stent expansion. Do we have an adequate result? And this is pretty easy. If you look at the rendered stent over here in the bottom, we see where the minimal stent area or MSA is. It's exactly where we want it to be. It's at the distal stent edge. Vessels naturally taper as you go from proximal to distal. So you want the smallest area of stent to be at the distal edge. We see that the MSA is there. But because we know vessels taper, expansion, which is a more relative term to what size the vessel should be at each given area, that can be different. So it's important to look at both the MSA and the overall expansion. So the computer and the software automatically calculates for you what's called the MEI, Minimal Expansion Index. And we see right here, it's in the middle portion of the stent. The goal for um, expansion is to have at least 80%. 
So you want to have at least 80% expansion. And we see here we've achieved 81% expansion. And you're able to analyze that. You get the luminaria. You see the diameter as well as the expansion index. So now post-PCI OCT assessment, we have clear imaging field throughout, including I'll go back and show you, you guys for the, the left main. So again, you can see without a guide extension catheter, here we're in a left main with areas over 16 and we have a perfectly clear field where you can still analyze the left main. So post PCI OCT, we've assessed in a matter of two minutes and ensured we've achieved all that we've set out to do. We've expanded that stent and there's no edge dissections and you could confidently ask for a closure device and know that your patient's gonna have a good outcome. And just to highlight, this on the left is the pre-MLA I had a minimum luminary of just 0.9 millimeters with a stent diameter 2.1 millimeters. And on the right, that same co-registered, that same cross-section, we see now we have a minimal lumen diameter 3.0 with areas of 8.7. The larger that area is, the less likely they're going to come back with the stent-related event. Okay. Thank you very much, Ivan. And uh, Tom. Any different uh, possibility in approaching uh, this uh, case? Uh, what uh, could be done in your lab uh, when uh, you are facing this uh, diffuse disease with ISR and a different type of tissue? Well, different type of tissue. So I think I, I mean I think Evan alluded to the fact that DCB is a technology not currently available in the state. So the question here is, would you deploy DCB? <laughs> I have to say that in the setting of this really quite extensive neoatherosclerosis, I'm probably going to do exactly what's been done here, which is deploy a second stent. So the trade-off being not wanting to overburden a vessel with unnecessary metal, but otherwise wanting to secure a result that's going to give both an acute and long-term outcome. So in, in a fibrotic restenotic vessel, the preparation and then delivery of drug just simply with a drug-coated balloon would be perfectly adequate in a large proportion. But I would predict that the preparation of this would potentially result in quite significant vessel injury, for which I only feel comfortable restenting. So, so once again, a highlight of the value to get uh, some information before start acting and try to get uh, actionable imaging based upon the type of tissue and the measurements uh, that uh, we can do it. Nieves, um, also your comment about uh, this uh, case, uh, what was done, what was achieved, uh, also critical comment. So I, I think the only, uh, the only thing I probably could have done different is try to check with a balloon if this stand that is under expand is gonna is gonna expand because actually I mean you can see here the comparison of the MLA and the final result and is 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 very good and actually uh, it, it must be an stand with a high capacity to to expand because it really changes uh, from 2.1 to more than 3.8 is uh, is really a stand with a high expansion capabilities but the problem if you have an under expand the stand even when we believe that there is no calcium behind. There's always a risk that if you implant a second stent, direct stenting without, you know, doing a balloon inflation before and make sure that it's going to expand, you have the risk of getting a double layer of underspanded stent. So this is, in my practice, I wouldn't recommend direct stenting in a restenosis if you have a stent under expansion. It's better to make sure that you're able to uh, expand this stent first, and then you can choose. We, in general, tend to use a lot of DCBs if we can, just to avoid uh, a second layer of a stent, especially in the first restenosis. Because we all know that patients with restenosis tend to come back, especially if it's a restenosis of a drug eluted stent. So if I have the chance to use DCB as first uh, a, a strategy in the first restenosis of the patient, I think this saves you some, uh, this gives you room for another stent in, in a second restenosis that could happen. Just we spoke about uh, the importance uh, to see the tissue, and uh, Iram in this case it was, uh, and even they were just uh, focused on the fact that there was no calcium. That is becoming more and more frequent uh, in our lab. And so when you have, a, and we said a few minutes ago, well, to get uh, this longer pullback in just a fraction of uh, seconds, uh, 
And then if you have a calcium, you need to prepare the lesion. And then you need, especially in ISR, you need to get some control. This is some additional reinforcement of the concept that sometimes we need to go multiple times inside the coronary artery, back and forth, and we need to get very highly resistant catheter, but also limiting the amount of contrast. What are you doing normally when you are facing this challenging patient with a calcium? Are you checking the results intermediately before going to the final decision? Yes, absolutely. I think that is critical, Julio. I think the beauty of this case is that illustrates the phenomenon of angiographic restenosis is, is not just a, a single entity, right? You have many different types of instant restenosis. I mean, we have seen the classifications from the past. But the good thing is, is that you actually see what is the problem here. You see that there is, in this case, there is no calcium, there is heterogeneous tissue in the stent. Uh, there is no calcium, but what if there would have been calcium? Why is this stand underexpanded? Is that stand underexpanded because there is calcium beyond it? Is that stand underexpanded because there was fibrotic tissue in a segment in which the stand was inflated, let's say at 12 atmospheres, just in a fraction of a second, as most operators do these days, instead of keeping the balloon up for a couple of seconds. So all these things with the imaging, you see it. And uh, the critical part, I tend to agree with Nevis, I would have, would have done a balloon first uh, as well, just to see if this old stand actually expanded. Um, but then again, you need to repeat the imaging. You need to repeat the imaging to see is the stand now actually in, in, uh, expanded. And only then you can decide, do I want to do a DCB? Do I want to put in a different stand simply because there's still a lot of tissue in the old stand? And by watching, you can see what you do and monitor the, uh, the, the process. If you don't check and just do the pre-PCI pullback, I don't think there's any point in doing any type of lesion preparation. And that not just counts for um, patients with instant restenosis, but to my opinion, to everybody with, uh, with diffuse disease and specifically calcium. So yeah, I would definitely repeat the imaging. Hiram, you have uh, one of the largest experience uh, in patients uh, using uh, this uh, uh, new version of uh, OCT. What uh, do you like the most? And how much is important to get uh, the measurements and especially the visualization of the EL, so the clarity that uh, Ivan was uh, showing uh, during uh, the pullback. Yeah, thank you, Julio. So I think my highlights for this method uh, in, in a real practical aspect is one, for routine case, uh, it really makes me like uh, smile <laughs> when I see the, the speed of this pullback as an opportunity to save die. Right, this is routine, any uh, type A lesion. On the, on the more complex patients, I, I feel that this is a case that probably I would have defer imaging up front, just because by doing this for many years, I know that I will not acquire a good quality image, and now we are pushing the, that bounder further down. Uh, this, this is one of the examples, right? I, I don't feel myself like uh, often open an OCT cutter just for post stent, right? I mean, if I cannot imagine pre, uh, I probably not imaging at all, right? So, if, I, uh, so can we stress this point uh, that perhaps it was uh, wrongly passed uh, during this uh, day? So we strongly think that uh, if you spend the money for getting a catheter out from the package, you need to benefit the most. And the most is not only in checking the final results when you already decide the strategy and what should be done, and you might correct. But it seems to the vast majority of the people in this room, the ones that are expert, that the most benefit is coming with imaging before. Yeah. And that is an important point that we wanted to highlight. Uh, uh, can, can I double down on this comment? That is the fact that uh, if you think about procedure planning, if you do it right, you should not often be surprised with the post. Right? The post should be confirmatory. To the point, don't, don't quote me on this, but uh, if I were to skip a step, I'm going to skip the post. 
because I'm so confident with my strategy that I, that I can, okay. Now, you have the cattle open to Dr. Gualium's point. I mean, I'm not adding a more dye. I'm going to take my final picture with the cattle as well, right? But uh, uh, the pre is where the, most of the benefit is. Haven, comment on that. Yeah, I think uh, just two things. One, procedural strategy, procedural planning. We accept that for TAVR. You would never implant a TAVR valve without actually measuring what size is the right valve. And I think we have to transform the way we approach PCI and standardize this. It should be universal that we're implanting prosthetic devices in someone's proximal LAD, and we need that to outdo a Lima. So if we want to get the best results, we have to come up with the best plan and you need to have a strategy and it shouldn't be eyeballing a moving target from a couple of feet away and just estimating based on the catheter size what the best stent is for that patient. If this was your family member, you'd want a precise result and that's why that baseline imaging I think is key. And just one other thing to mention about this technology that hasn't been mentioned yet, um, we all work not in isolation, but with a team, including techs and nurses. And it's really important to set up because that could sometimes be a barrier if it's a difficult setup. And this is a plug and play uh, system, which really is novel and I think drives utilization because if it's easy and quick to set up, um, you know, you can stop by the booth in the exhibit hall to, to, to see it, but essentially a plug and play similar to um, phased so array there, there, there is no bagging. Right. No bagging. You simply hand over the, the end of the catheter off the sterile field and plug it in. And that rapidity to be able to prep the device, I think, is essential in using this as standard of care as part of your workflow. So thank you very much. We are arriving to the end of this session, and we would like to have Iram in a single slide make uh, the sum up of what we saw and in terms of a major concept, Iram. So uh, I, we're gonna leave you all with this single slide that uh, has a hundred millimeters of uh, crystal clear image without any pre-dilatation in, in lumens that are, were uh, nominally occlusive to any other image method. So we are really open and frontier here. There are uh, options to do this case in a very streamlined fashion uh, with a less dye and a very consistent image quality. So if these were some of the barriers that you, you had to adopt imaging, they are pretty much gone uh, with this new technology. I want to thank you, Dr. Gualiumi, to be the maestro for this session and, and all the panelists there. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to Avon. He spent a lot of time in shaping and reshaping the case for, for you and try to give you the flavor of what this technology can be. And uh, uh, well, you have a three, uh, you have a five people that are just uh, supporting imaging. I think that we wanted to transfer to, to the audience that we are escalating a little bit with the level of complexity of the patients. And the more and more you are seeing this type of lesion of patients, and then we wanted to get a precise plan and the precise measurements. And uh, of course, it's a longer way, also in terms of uh, multiple requirements. Yeah, we, we heard before, and uh, we would like just to finish this session on time is a blended session, so thank you to the people that are watching us from the distance. We hope to be able to get this message also to you. And I would say that thank you very much for your contribution. It was outstanding. Thank you. Thank you.